Hello, welcome to the University of Brighton podcast. I'm Richard Newman. This is the podcast which catches up with students and academics from the university and uses their expertise to touch on issues affecting the world today. This week, we've had the major announcements of the next stage of easing lockdown in England during the coronavirus pandemic. Pubs and restaurants will be able to reopen, as will many other businesses, and we can all get a haircut. So will this save businesses and start to stimulate the UK economy? Well, this week, I'm joined by Dr. Rob Hayward, Senior Lecturer from Brighton Business School and Course Leader for MSC Finance. Thanks for coming on, Rob. How are you doing and how have you found life since lockdown was first introduced? I'm doing okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm getting along okay, but uh, the novelty's worn off. I'm uh, looking forward to getting out and about a bit more. Uh, I've been stuck here at home. I've been going to the beach occasionally, but I want to uh, take advantage of the opening up of some of the uh, shops and restaurants and pubs eventually. Yeah, uh, let's get to know a bit more about you first then. I think, Rob, what's your background and how long have you been at the university? I've been here at the University of Brighton for around about uh, 20 years now, more or less. Um, before that, I used to work as an economist at a bank, uh, forecasting interest rates, exchange rates, and advising uh, customers and people in the bank about what would happen to the economy and what would happen to uh, financial markets as well. Mm, which is useful for this podcast, which we're going to be talking about. But what, um, what tempted you to move into academia that 20 years ago? Well, I mean, I've worked uh, in financial services for 15 years or so. Um, and I just thought it was a time for a change. I had some children and it needed a bit more focus on them and a bit less focus on uh, financial markets. And, and I think it's a nice uh, position to be in academia because it's a bit more flexible it's hard work of course but it's a bit more of a flexible life it's not so much get there at nine o'clock and leave at five it depends on what's happening that day and there's a much more scope to do things at home hmm. okay let's talk about the current situation firstly we'll go back to before the announcement shops have been reopened now for nearly two weeks so what do you think the early impact might be for for business owners well, I think they'll be very relieved, of course, to uh, be opening up again. Um, it's been a huge shock. And, uh, and of course, some businesses are not going to be able to reopen. It will be too much for them. And so they will inevitably go bankrupt, I'm afraid. But the ones that have survived, I think that they're going to enjoy the initial bounce in spending because, of course, everyone has been cooped up at home. They've been limited in what they can spend money on. Um, and I think there's going to be an initial wave of spending, which is going to help everybody. The, the, the key question really is how far that increase in spending uh, permeates through the rest of the year. Because, of course, although there's been a big increase in the savings rate as people have in many cases have been paid but have been unable to spend the money uh there's also been an increase in savings because people are worried and the more that people are worried about the future the more they will tend to keep their savings and be a bit cautious about their spending so i suppose one of the things the government would try to do is is, is to encourage confidence and try to get people spending i think we've seen ministers trying to do that yeah, I will talk about a little bit later about what the Chancellor might do to, to help push that up a bit further. Just about the shops that are reopened. I mean, you know, lockdown's been, we've had this now for about three months. So it, by this point, this is, this is a sort of usual amount of time when habits start to become, you know, a, a routine. Uh, so we used to now shopping online a lot more and a lot of businesses are better equipped to do that. So some of those smaller local businesses, are some of them probably going to struggle a little bit because of the fact that the, there are these change of habits. There is the, the caution of, of not spending too much money. And there's also the safety aspect that people, some people just don't want to take the risk just to go browsing in a shop. That's certainly true. And I, and I think it, 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 you mentioned a lot of things there which are uncertain and that makes it very difficult to know actually what's going to happen. Certainly some people uh, are vulnerable and they will not go out. Some people are worried and they are going to hold back as well. There are habits now and certainly institutions, shops are more able to deliver uh, resources remotely so that's a change in the way that things are taking place but I think there's also a, a kind of social aspect to shopping that people actually like to go out and meet people and I think that's one thing that will cause people to move away even though they can buy things online they want to get out in the shops they want to actually feel and touch things so I think that works the other way and I think 
the retail industry will be hoping that that is going to be unleashed as well with a big wave of spending. Mm. The measures put in place by the government yesterday, wide ranging, of course, but generally, what do you make of them? Well, I think they're part of the attempt to get things back to normal, whatever that is. Um, it, it's an attempt to encourage people to spend more. Um, I, I think we've heard that the uh, shops and the retailers have been quite pleased that there's been a bit of flexibility introduced to the two meter uh, distancing. So that gives them more flexibility. Mm. I mean, it's going to be difficult for them because even though they're opening up, they're not opening up in exactly the same way as which they closed. They're going to have to put in place measures. They're going to be expensive. They're going to mean that shops can't be filled up with people, which is exactly what they would like to see, that they're going to have to accept that there's going to be less footfall and probably less spending as a result. How crucial is it that pubs, restaurants are permitted to open from 4th of July? For some of those businesses, could they have lasted much longer? I mean, some of them have been quite innovative in terms of their takeaway offering that they've been able to offer over the last few months. But there's no doubt, you know, in general, from the government, there was a decision to be made here between relaxing the rules, stimulating the economy, and the other side, which is controlling the virus. And it sort of applies to all of us, doesn't it? That's right. I mean, it's a delicate balance and it's made more difficult by the fact that we don't really know everything we'd like to about the virus. And so we're not sure how it's going to evolve. I think certainly the government has a difficult job to try to balance the economy and the health effects. And I think they're kind of putting the emphasis on people to try to make up their own mind. I think they clearly want to get the economy moving as quickly as possible, because as you say, Although shops have been quite innovative in the way that they've responded to the crisis, I think in most cases, shops are dealing with quite low profit margins. And so they haven't got much scope to last for a number of months without getting any um, uh, revenue from shopping. They, they have fixed costs in many cases, although some of those might have been deferred. Certainly the taxes have, but they always have some expenditure. And so I think the longer it goes on, the more retail establishments will go bankrupt. And so the quicker the government can get things moving again, the more likely it is we can save some of these small businesses. Mm. And a lot of those tax uh, measures that you've been talking about are only short-term, of course. It's just a short-term respite for them before they have to catch up a little bit later on. And there are other businesses that can't open that actually probably expected that they might be able to on the 4th of July. I know one of the big ones that we talked about over the last 24 hours with recording this on a Wednesday um, it's the fact that gyms can't reopen I think they very much expected that they would be able to um, they can't go on forever can they this is they're now at a point where they've probably been targeting the 4th of July for the last couple of months and and, and now they're gonna have to wait a lot longer and and some businesses are not going to be able to survive that that's certainly the case I mean I, I think it's it's a bit unclear how damaging the emergence from the lockdown will be. But I, I think there's a risk that it's going to be quite painful over the next six months. That the end of the furlough scheme will mean that business will start to lay people off. Um, the fact that we have more people becoming unemployed will be a bit of a shock. Um, and it's not, I don't think, going to be a just a smooth bounce back to where we were before. It's going to take a long time to get there if we ever do. And I think that there's going to be a, a, a quite a painful adjustment process to move the economy back to even the level of uh, output and employment, which we had back in January and February. Mm. How much damage do you think has already been done to the UK economy? How big is this? I mean, it's a huge amount. We've never seen anything like this. So it's, it's, it's almost impossible to say that there's not been a situation where we've had such a shutdown in the economy. It's almost like some people have said that it's, that it's, it's putting the economy to sleep and then opening up again. And, and, and though it hasn't died completely, it is the sort of shock that if you look at any of the uh, diagrams of the uh, performance of the economy, they're just shocking. That mm. They show that what we've seen in terms of reduced output, uh, increase in unemployment, decline in spending is never really taken place before and so although the government i think has, has put in place measures to try to alleviate the pain it, it, it's inevitably going to be quite deep rooted um, and i think it's going to be long lasting as well mm. uh, how how much can 
how much help can there be to stimulate the UK economy? We've heard about um, tax breaks potentially. We've talked about lowering VAT, um, moves that the Chancellor could announce in the, we're expected to announce in, in the coming weeks some measures. What would help to get people spending? Well, I, I think the main things really are to try to encourage demand, encourage spending. Um, and there's different ways that can be done. I, th I mean, I think the shops are saying cut VAT, and, and, and certainly that's one solution. In the past, it hasn't proved to be as, as valuable as people had anticipated. And you do have the problem, if you cut it temporarily, at some point it's going to go up again. And when it goes back up again, you have the risk that spending goes back down. I mean, I think that, that, that there's greater scope, I would say, over the medium-term picture for the government to spend more money on green projects. There's lots and lots of things which have to be done in order to get us to a carbon neutral economy. And now's the time to do them because the government can borrow money very cheaply. And if the government borrows money and embarks on these projects, um, uh, building um, uh, infrastructure, which is going to help the economy, building uh, a green energy resources, uh, helping public transport, um, changing the um, insulation of homes, all these things are things which could be done and, and which need to be done anyway. And they're the sort of things which the government can employ people who have been made unemployed, get them spending and giving them more confidence. Yeah, I've even seen this week in, um, in Brighton the fact that there's going to be a new uh, cycle lane uh, on the seafront, which is going to be better for, which has just been passed last night. So I think you're seeing things that are being done and maybe they've become things that are, uh, not so temporary, but become a lot more permanent in the future. And you're seeing things this that will move that direction. Just how big a job do you think the Chancellor has going forward? Do you envy well, him? I, I mean, <laughs> not really. I mean, I think he's in a quite a, a decent position at present because he's quite popular, he's quite articulate, and he's been giving lots of money away. But uh, in the future, there's going to be some pressure on him to do something about the government deficit and about the amount of debt which has been built up. I mean, the debt has become bigger than the UK economy and there's going to be some people who say, well, you must do something about that. You must raise taxes, you must cut spending. I think that there's a big argument to say that that's not the time to do this. At the moment, we need to increase demand and with interest rates for government borrowing so low, it's an opportunity to lock in those low interest rates, borrow for a long period of time and use the money which you've borrowed for these infrastructure projects. And I think the problem with the Chancellor now is that he's going to be in a more tricky position because at the moment everyone says, we agree that you should be doing things to help people and, and support employment. But as we move through the rest of the year, I think there's going to be one group of people saying, cut the deficit, cut the deficit. And there's going to be some talk about maybe moving back to austerity. And I think that's one thing that should be opposed uh, if at all possible. You're talking about borrowing there, and in terms of um, us as consumers uh, lending, uh, borrowing as well, we're seeing that lenders are, are changing their behaviour at the moment nationwide among those to cap mortgage lending, for example. Uh, do you think that there will be incentives to encourage more borrowing, or are we going to see a tighter squeeze? I think the risk is that the, the, the lenders are going to be cautious. I mean, the lenders know already that people who borrowed money in the past some of them are not going to be able to pay back and that's really what the nationwide is reflecting i think that from the government point of view the central banks cut interest rates to virtually zero so there's nothing that really can be done there um i think that really again i, I would argue on the demand side if you can get the economy going then the more businesses are going to be successful the more people are going to be employed and the more likely it is then they can pay back their debt. So there's a, there's a sort of virtuous circle there. Um, and, and if the economy does contract more severely and suffer more badly than, than we hope, then I think that it, it, there is a risk that lenders will become even tighter with their lending and that will exacerbate the problem. So we need to try to avoid that if we can. Mm. Big question then, just how bad is this impending recession going to be? How much of an impact could this have for I mean, and how many years? I mean, how, how long are we going to see this become be a massive issue? I, I think it's impossible to say that. I mean, I would like to have the ball and tell you exactly, but you, you've said yourself yeah. some of the uncertainties which are out there. I think probably the most important things will be the decisions which are taking, such as 
whether the government continues to support the economy with spending, um, whether we have some kind of smooth agreement with the European Union at the end of the year, which allows us to continue trading effectively there. And probably in the bigger picture, what happens to countries around the world? I mean, there's some movements towards a more protectionist world. And, and if they gather steam, then I think it's only going to exacerbate the downward pressure, not just on the UK economies, but economies around the world. And so I think there are some risks out there, which in, in this uncertain time make it even more worrying slightly. I think maybe a better way for me to rephrase that question, I guess, would be to say, what, what would you think would be the best and the worst case scenario um, during a recession? Well, the best case is, is the idea that we've stopped briefly and now everything's been opened up again and everything's going to bounce back and we will just take off where we left off before. This is the scenario, which is a so-called V-shaped recovery. Uh, I think most economists are quite skeptical about that doesn't mean it won't happen just because they're skeptical. I mean, it's possible. I mean, there's, as we said before, a big buildup of savings, which could be unleashed. I think probably, as we said before, there's going to be some caution. It's much more likely to be a kind of prolonged, gradual recovery. And, and hopefully that, that's what we'll see. As I said before, I think the, 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 the more dismal outlook would be one where the government stops supporting economic activity, we have a crashing out of the European Union without an agreement. We have more general trade protectionism around the world. And, and then it could be much more prolonged and much, much more painful. Mm. The world's going to be a very different place over the next, the next couple of years, isn't it? We're going to have to get used to very different ways of spending and managing our money. I think that's right. I mean, we've already had a, 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 a shock over the last three months. I mean, it's something which none of us could have envisaged, let alone any of us having um, experienced it before. So we're, we're sort of used to things changing now. And I suppose in some ways we're moving back to what we expect to happen, that we're actually going to be able to go out rather than just leave the house once a day, which is what it was back in March. And it, even looking back in March, it seems so long ago that how things have evolved and how we're now cautiously emerging from that lockdown. So yeah, 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 it's going to be different. Uh, but hopefully we can get some good things out of this as well. I mean, as I said before, there's, there's some opportunities to uh, spend money on some green projects. And some of the behavior has changed. Like you mentioned, the cycle lanes, certainly people have been finding other ways in which to get around if they're a bit cautious about public transport. In simple terms, how have financial markets not been completely brought down <laughs> by the impact of coronavirus, especially at that initial shock phase where everyone was going to lockdown? Well, I, I think it, it's, it's slightly a mystery because in March, when the lockdown started, there was a collapse that stock markets particularly fell 20 or 30%. And, and that's probably what you'd expect because the stock markets reflect future profitability. And if you close the economy down, then profits are going down as well. Since then, what we've seen in the US and to a lesser extent elsewhere in the world, is a recovery in those stock markets. And people have been saying that doesn't really fit in with the general idea that the economy is going to struggle to recovery. And, 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 and the explanation, people say, is, is because central banks around the world have been pumping money into the economy. They have got interest rates at zero. And to increase the monetary pressure, they've just pumped money into the banking system. And that money has to go somewhere. Um, it seems to me that still stock markets are quite vulnerable, that if we don't get a nice smooth recovery, stock markets are going to fall. And, and I think it also highlights the fact that there's a limit to what monetary policy can do. If you pump money into the economy, it's not necessarily going to normal people encourage them to spend. It might just flow straight through into financial markets, creating the prospect of new bubbles. And I think, again, this argues that it should be the government doing something with fiscal policy cutting taxes maybe but even more so i think spending money where it can really improve the future of the economy on top of all this as you mentioned already is brexit I mean, the transition period is meant to end on new year's eve that's only six months away during a time when priorities for all nations are elsewhere you know it's one of those things we've sort of gone to that we've been talking about for years and it's kind of gone to the back of our minds and suddenly it's going to creep up i mean how much of a disaster would it be if there were no trade agreements that we ended up leaving in a no deal situation on the back of all of this turmoil from coronavirus 
Well, I, th I think it's got to be terrible. I mean, I think it's to be avoided, but it, it's hard to see how that can happen. I mean, I know in negotiations you've got to look tough and you've got to pretend that you're never going to back down, but it, it seems that the, both sides are entrenched in positions where it's hard to reach an agreement. That said, I mean, European Union is, has a history of pulling something out of the bag at the last minute, but I'm not sure that that is the same with the UK government. So they, they really are entrenched in saying they won't do this, they won't do that, and also that they won't extend the negotiating period. And as you say, it's been quite hard to negotiate when the focus has been on COVID and when it's it been impossible to meet face-to-face, -face, more or less. So uh, I think that this is one of the concerns I have about the outlook for the economy on top of the COVID-19 shock, we might get a second shock, which comes from the breakdown in trade with the European Union, which of course is our biggest trading partner. And that, that, that's another risk. Mm. I mean, what about a scenario where, you know, we are just a couple of months away from the end of that negotiating period, it hasn't been extended, then there's a second wave of the virus. I mean, that would that be pretty, that would be pretty catastrophic, wouldn't it? Uh, it would, of course. It, it would, of course. But I mean, on the other hand, hopefully that would concentrate some minds and encourage both sides to come up with something which would prevent that from happening. Because it mm. would be a, a terrible to have a double shock. Yeah, you'd hope so. This must be a really interesting time for you in your field. Um, a great time to to study business, financial markets. I mean, like you said, never seen anything like it before. And I, I imagine it's a fascinating time to be an expert in your area. Well, it, it, it is interesting, that's for sure. And in, in a way, it's been interesting since the global financial crisis because we had a huge shock then. We had a big interest in economics because suddenly people saw how large the effect could be on their lives. I think in the period before that, the economy just chugged along nicely and calmly and, and so people forgot about it. And, and over the last five or six years, we've had lots and lots of uh, emphasis on the importance of the financial sector, the greening of the economy, the circular economy, trying to make sure that we can um, have an economy which is sustainable. And so oh, there's a huge amount of interest in economics and, and that makes it great for me, of course. Yeah, great time to study it as well and to study at the University of Brighton and with a new building on the way as well. I mean, how would you encourage students to, that uh, this is the right place to come? Well, I think that, I mean, it's a great time Stud it's a great place to live in Brighton and um, as you say we've got a new building which is going to be opening up very soon and we are really interested in economics not just the traditional economics but also thinking about new ways in which we can ensure that the economy works well for everybody uh, and we've got a, a, a mission statement here that we are interested in the um, uh, responsible enterprise so we're interested in not just making as much money as possible but making sure that things work for everybody now at the end of each podcast um we ask some questions um away from your work we ask the same questions to everyone that comes on so first one what advice would you give to your younger self well i, I think probably i would say don't overthink things or take too long about making decisions of course get as much information as you can but it ends up actually that Lots of things are just about luck, good luck and bad luck, and you can't really control that. So make a decision and then go with it. Mm. If you could pick um, a different subject to study at the University of Brighton, what would it be? Well, I was thinking about this. And I was thinking I'd actually like to do art. I mean, it's very different from what I do now. So I think I would really enjoy that. I mean, I'm rubbish at art, so I probably wouldn't be allowed in. But if I was allowed in, I would take that. Certainly. Is that a hobby that you have, though, outside of work? Not really, but it seems really yeah. interesting. And I think if I was in a course and I was forced to do it, I would learn something about it and hopefully I would improve somehow. Yeah. Um, what positive changes have you experienced from life in lockdown that you might end up taking forward? Well, well uh, I've had my children at home, so it's been a bit more tricky. Obviously, we've been cooking and my son is, is unable to eat cheese. My daughter doesn't eat any meat and so we've had to be very flexible with our cooking and i've come up with lots and lots of new recipes i've been eating more uh fruit and vegetables and i think that's a positive thing for the future yeah and um, can you pick a favorite place in sussex well for me it's it's at the amex uh <laughs> behind the goal when brighton score a goal so uh it would have been great on saturday when they scored against arsenal it'd been right in front of where i was standing 
But mm. of course, the stadium's closed now. For me, that's the best place. Yeah. Uh, when lockdown has lifted, if you could give visitors to Brighton and the area a tip of what to do or experience, what would it be? Well, one thing I've enjoyed, and which actually you can do under lockdown, but it will open up more for people after the changes take place, is to cycle from Brighton to Rottingdean. And you can cycle across the cliffs and then back along the seafront. It's a really lovely journey. And in fact, you can adapt the journey according to the weather if the wind is behind you you want to be on the cliffs and if the wind's ahead of you then you want to come back along the uh, along the underside and it's a it's a it's a, a really great view of brighton up there on the cliffs and it takes you about an hour or so so i'd really recommend people doing this i second that one um tell us something interesting about you which a lot of people may not know well, I'm not sure it's interesting, but, but unusual is that I used to be a cycle messenger in New York. And so I was delivering packages around the city around about 1986 or something like this. Um, and I had been a cycle messenger in London. And the difference between the two was in London, of course, it's, it's quite, you need an A to Z. You, the first few weeks, you spend all your time looking at the street names, trying to find things. But in New York, I, I never had a map on the first day and I thought I'll buy one when I need one, but I never needed one. It's just the streets are just sequential. Once you know the avenues, you never need a map. You could just go wherever you want. So it was an unusual job I had for a while. Yeah, no, that is interesting. Um, and if you could pick three people to have to dinner, uh, who would they be and why? Well, I, I've chosen, first of all, Muhammad Ali because I think he's the greatest sportsman. And, and on top of that, a fantastic human being. And, and, would have been an even greater sportsman if he hadn't missed the best years uh, banned from boxing because of his opposition to the Vietnam draft. So I think he would be fantastic. Um, the second one I've got is, is, is John Maynard Keynes. And it sounds like a boring one for an economist to come up with, but actually Keynes is really interesting that he was not only the inventor of macroeconomics, more or less, he was also uh, a member of the government and advisor. He was at the Versailles Peace Treaty and he famously identified the damage that that treaty would cause. He was the architect of the post-war international economic system. He was a big writer. His books were bestsellers. He was also a member of the Bloomsbury Group, this, this artistic group which included uh, Virginia Woolf. So I think he would be fantastic. And uh, on his death, he famously was asked any regrets and his, his answer was uh, that I didn't drink more champagne. So I think he would be great at a dinner party. <laughs> My final one is uh, Bobby Moore. Um, I'm a West Ham supporter. And as the, as the West Ham slipped into the championship, it would just be nice to be reminded of that day back in 1966 when West Ham won the World Cup. So those, those would be my three. Um, I'm not sure what they would have to say to each other, but I'm, I think it would be interesting. So you a, are you a West Ham supporter with a Brighton season ticket? That's me, yeah. I go with my son, so he, I've, I've kept him away from West Ham because I've inflicted enough upon him without making him a West Ham fan. He sports Brighton. <laughs> Been painful in the recent times as well, but hopefully all all right from here on. Rob, thanks so much for your time. Really good to get your views on the current state of the economy during these odd times. It's great to have you on. Thanks very much. I've really enjoyed it. Uh, that's it for this week. Please do subscribe and share on social media channels. You can also watch this on YouTube and listen via Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Bye for now.